Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head was a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign or wonder appeared in heaven, and behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth and he stood there to devour the child, capital C, if you're reading it, as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a wrought iron and her child was caught up to God and his throne. I'm going to go through this entire chapter, but I wanted to start off with those first five verses just talking about this wonder woman that Revelation chapter 12 talks about that the entire end time prophecy will be centered upon this particular wonder woman. And we're going to focus in on that because that wonder woman is the nation of Israel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you've deposited in our hearts over the last several weeks. I've sensed a shift in my own spirit, an excitement, an expectancy. God, about all that you're wanting to do through this place and through these great people. And we are living in those last days. And we thank you for the privilege of just being able to hear your heart on some of these things. And Father, teach us today. Lord, your word says grace teaches us. And so I pray that the grace of God teach and instruct us so we can know exactly what we're to do daily, every day. Encourage us in our daily life through some of these ideas that you gave us in the book of Revelation in Jesus name. And once again, we thank you for the special blessing that comes on those who read this book. And we all said, amen. amen. I do believe that it's important to consider as a Bible believing Christian, if that suits you, that it's almost impossible. I, I would say it's very difficult at a minimum to disregard the nation of Israel. Israel has had a special place in God's heart from the very beginning. You can't read the Bible without seeing that God has a heart and a plan for the nation of Israel. In the beginning, we see this. We see that after the fall, God wants to create for himself a people that he can show himself to, that he can reveal himself to, and that he can reveal himself through. And so he goes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I'm going to promise you a son. You're old, but I'm going to give you a son. And the result is through your seed, I'm going to give you a nation. And the nations of the earth will be blessed through this particular seed. And we all know Abraham, uh, or I guess Sarah, has the child Isaac. And of course, Isaac then, you know, goes on and, and the 12 tribes of Israel come and the nation of Israel is a result of God's promise to Abraham. And everything you read in your Bible, you're gonna to begin to watch, if you read the Bible, you're gonna to begin to see God's hand in a special way in the beginning and all through scripture on the nation of Israel. And the reason I say this is because now here we are in the very end. This is, this is in front of us. This is out in the future. This is a book of prophecy. And what we're reading about is Israel is also in the end. It's important that you consider that Israel never has, nor will she ever cease to be a part of God's master plan to restore and redeem all of creation back to himself. It's important that you consider she was relevant in the beginning and she is also now relevant in the end. Israel in verse one, it says that there is this wonder woman or this sign, this woman that's clothed with the sun. This is speaking of the nation of Israel. And we know this because it says her crown has 12 stars that speaks of the 12 tribes of Israel. She's in labor and it says that she gives birth to a male child. The, our Catholic brothers and sisters interpret this as Mary. And yes, the Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus. But this is speaking about something different. This is speaking about the nation of Israel. So yes, Jesus 
came through the Virgin Mary, but remember that he is also known as the son of Israel or the child of Israel. Isaiah in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, he's prophesying to the nation of Israel and he says, unto us who Israel, a child will be born. We know that in Hebrews, Jesus is called the seed of Abraham. And so I'm hoping that you can understand that Revelation chapter 12 introduces once again that Israel is not Old Testament is not Old Covenant. They didn't fall out of relevance because of their unbelief. They always have and always will be a part of God's plan. And we find this in New Testament prophecy. This is important for four reasons to every single person in this room. Four reasons you should respect this wonder woman that we read about in Revelation chapter 12. Number one, Israel has favor with God. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 6 through 9 says that she's a holy people, that God has chosen Israel and that he's called her to be a special treasure above all the people of the earth. And it says not because she's great in herself, she's actually the opposite. It goes on to say that she's the least of all people, but God chose to show his love to her. And because God showed his love to her, they became, Israel became a great people. And as it is with the natural Israel, so it is with the spiritual Israel, that's the church. We would know that God favors us, not because we're special, but we become special because of God's favor. God doesn't love us because we're valuable. We become valuable when we recognize God's love for us. And Israel was the first recipient of receiving the idea that God chose this special people. He revealed himself to this special people. He revealed himself through this special people. And he has never, nor will he ever stop favoring Israel. Isaiah chapter four, verse three through five says that Israel is favored. Israel is called. Israel was God created and is God protected. All you have to do is go study the basics and you can see that God has and always will protect Israel. Romans chapter nine and verse four, God chose Israel. He chose to show Israel his glory. He gave Israel his covenant. He gave them the law or your Old Testament. He used them for service and he also gave them the promise of the Messiah. Verse five of that same chapter says in the natural or the flesh, Israel gave you and I Jesus. So ultimately, yes, God was the one who had a plan to, in Genesis chapter three, he had the plan to produce a seed that Satan would bruise his heel, but he would crush the head of Satan. Yes, that's ultimately God's plan, but who did God choose to use to bring that about? He chose Israel. And so Israel gave you the Bible that you read. They gave us Jesus. They gave us the word on paper and they gave us the word wrapped in flesh. So the bottom line is Israel matters and is favored by God. Israel is a nation God created. They are God decreed, God loved, God called, God elected, God protected, and God favored. They gave you the Bible. They gave you your Messiah. So your faith is directly connected. John 4 says salvation has come through the Jews. Genesis chapter 12, verse two through three says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Watch what God will do. I will bless those who bless Israel. I will curse those who curse Israel. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What did God tell us? He said, if you want to find out how the blessing of God works is you go find what God's blessing and you bless it. When that hap when you do that, God blesses you. You find what God's favoring. You don't question it. You don't debate it. You don't fight it. You don't argue it. You say, man, God's favoring that. God's favoring them. And I'm going to favor what he favors. And then God's favor comes on you. But if you go 
after something that God has blessed and God has favored and you start cursing it, the Bible says you cannot curse what God has blessed. And so the opposite happens. That curse bounces back on you. What's curse? It means to speak down to, speak negatively to, say they don't deserve to have a future. That's what curse means. I'm going to say they don't deserve to be a people. When you do that, that jumps back on you. And so we have to As God's people say, God has always loved Israel. God has always favored Israel. And I want his favor. I want his blessing. So I'm going to bless what he's blessed. And I'm going to favor what he's favored. (laughs) Remember in the story of Joseph, there were two pharaohs. The first pharaoh that is introduced in the story, the Bible says, favors Joseph. Of course, Joseph and this Pharaoh had a great plan. Joseph interprets his dream. Joseph comes up with this divine plan to build these massive silos and store harvest so they can have it during the seven years of plenty. They can be prepared for the seven years of famine. As a result of this plan, the nation of Egypt becomes incredibly blessed. This Pharaoh sees that Joseph is a key to this massive prosperity. And so this Pharaoh begins to bless Joseph. He gives Joseph land. He gives Joseph's brother's land. He gives Joseph's dad land. That land becomes the geographical area that now we know is the nation of Israel. That that Pharaoh favored Joseph and he blessed Joseph. His whole life, that's what was going on. The result was because he was blessing Israel. Notice what happens. Egypt expands its empire. Egypt becomes the mightiest economy, has the mightiest, mightiest military on the planet because of their desire to favor what God had favored. As long as that happened, Egypt expanded. As long as Egypt favored Israel, they expanded. They were blessed. God gave them favor. But that Pharaoh died. Another Pharaoh was raised up and this Pharaoh did not favor Joseph. And the Bible says he actually did the opposite. He thought The children of Israel are too blessed. They have too much. I want to take away what they have. Let's enslave them. Let's not only enslave them, let's oppress them. Let's take all the male children under the age of two because they've become too many, too populous. And so that Pharaoh took all the male children under the age of two, threw them, killed them, threw them in the River Nile, destroyed, killed all those male children. Now watch what happens. This is the Pharaoh that God swallows up in the Red Sea. At one moment, he's the mightiest man on earth. The next moment, he's fish food because he thought you could curse what God has blessed and then God cursed him. Israel is favored by God, whether you like it or not. And I'm gonna walk you through it. You're gonna get it by the end, but it's important that you stay careful in your own heart to say, I don't completely always understand God, but what I do know is when God's blessing something, my responsibility is to bless what God has blessed. Number two, so Israel has favor. Number two, Israel has foes. Verse three of Revelation chapter 12 introduces the fiery red dragon. Verse nine says the dragon is a depiction of the devil himself. His color is red, which represents that he's bloodthirsty. John 8, 44 introduces the devil as a murderer. Jesus calls the devil a murderer. He was a murderer from the beginning. In Luke 4, we see the devil trying to use an angry mob to kill Jesus. We see the devil trying to talk Jesus into throwing himself off of the high pinnacle and commit suicide. So the devil is bloodthirsty. Verse 4 describes what we see in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, where the tail of the dragon, it explains, takes one third of the stars, that's symbolic of the angels from heaven, and that, the, that dragon's tail brings those angels with him and they fall from heaven to earth. Know that the devil and his fallen angels don't go to hell, they end up on earth. The good news is this for those of us who are here on this planet. This is the good news. Leonard Ravenhill said that two thirds of the angels did not fall. So you have two angels for every demon. Every time the devil attacks you, no, more are for you than are against you. Verse four says that this dragon is intent on bringing suffering toward the child, the male child. 
he desires to devour the child. This speaks of how Herod waited for the child Jesus to be born. And then he issued the order to kill all the, child, the male children under the age of three. This is the picture of the dragon. That he's always looking to devour God's son, God's seed, God's plan. Because he knows the plan was that this child, this seed would come and crush his head crush his authority and crush his dominion. And so he waited, he watched, he looked, and then finally the child is born and he doesn't know exactly who the child is. So he just says, I'm gonna try to kill every child I possibly can. The Bible says in verse three that he has seven heads, which teaches us that Satan is very, very wise. Is he corrupt and evil? Yes, but dumb? No, he is very wise. And that's why as the people of God, we must become much wiser in these days than we've ever been before. We have to become discerning and we have to know what the Bible teaches about these things so we can see the enemy's tactics and strategies in these last days. And so Jesus said of Satan that he is the prince of this world. He's not the king, but he is the prince. He's looking to be king. He's looking to rule and reign. So Israel has a foe. That foe is not flesh and blood. That foe is spiritual. Any hatred that is against the Jewish people is is started in the heart of the devil and is from hell and he does everything he can to deceive and lie and corrupt anybody he can and put the same hatred he has for the Jewish people and the Bible goes on to tell us why. So it's very clear, let's watch this, that in chapter 12, Satan is the antichrist, he's anti-Semitic, he's anti-faith and he's anti the church. Satan hates Jesus, he hates the Jews, he hates Israel, and he hates you, the spiritual Israel or the church. So because Jesus loves me and because I love Jesus, I love what Jesus loves. So I love the Jewish people, I love Israel, I love the Palestinian people, I love the Egyptian people, I love... The, I love all the Syrians, all the people of the Middle East because Jesus loves them. But if there is an attack on Israel, I have to know where that attack comes from. Again, that is not flesh and blood. That is a hatred, hatred from hell. And my job is to simply say, I cannot set back as a Christian and say that there is any reason for any hatred to be towards the Jewish people, except the spiritual reasons. Why, why, why isn't the world against the French? Why isn't the world against the Australians? Why isn't the world against the Europeans? Why is the whole world focused on this small little nation and this small group of people? Why is the whole world attacking them? It is spiritual. So understand that the devil hates Israel because Israel gave you Jesus. Now, it goes on to say that Israel has to fight. Verse 7 says there's two battles that take place in this chapter. There's a war in heaven and a war on earth. The first battle is spiritual. Michael and his angels fight with the dragon and his angels and Satan loses this fight. He falls from heaven to earth, but he knows that this is not the final fall. Eventually he falls from earth to hell, so he keeps going down. Verse 12 and 13 says, because he knows this, he's violent, he's full of rage because he knows his time is short. How does he know his time is short? Because he has access to the same prophecies you do. And so you go to Matthew chapter 24 and you read that Israel had to become a nation. And once they did, that we were at the door of the end times. That happened in 1948. So that's 71 years ago. Your Bible in Matthew 24 says that a generation shall not pass from the earth after that day happens. A generation in the Bible is 70 to 80 years. Anything after that's a benefit. I'm not here to predict anything because the Bible says to not do that. But I'm just here to say it's been 70 one year since Israel has become a nation and the generation is wrapping up. So the devil hears that, the devil reads that, the devil hears sermons like this and what does he know? His time is short. So his rage is increasing, his deception is increasing, his attacks are 
increasing. And the more you see the world focus on Israel and attack Israel, no, that's a spiritual sign that the devil knows his time is almost up. The Bible says, woe to those who live on the earth in these times because of the desperate rage we will experience from the enemy. But it goes on to say we will overcome that rage by the blood of Jesus. So his blood not only cleanses us, his blood gives us victory and gives us the ability to conquer anything that tries to attack us. So there's a war in heaven and there's a war on earth. And verse 13 tells us why this woman Israel gave birth to the male child, capital C, that's Jesus. And Satan hates Israel because Israel gave you and I Jesus. It's important that you understand that. There is a reflection when you see the hatred for Israel, that, that ref any conflict is a reflection of what we read about when Jesus came and he died on a horrible cross and then he went to hell and he took back the keys of death, hell and the grave. He crushed the head of the enemy. And because that happened, the enemy hates Israel because Israel was what birthed the seed that crushed his head. Verse 14 speaks of a great eagle with two wings that protect Israel and nourish Israel. Many people believe that that could be America in these last days. And I pray that it is. And I pray that we'll always stand with God's people. Because if we bless her, God blesses us. If we favor her, God favors us. So not only is Satan dead set on destroying Israel... But he's also dead set on destroying anyone that loves Jesus. So don't be naive that the hatred that you see there isn't the beginning of a hatred that's going to bleed over into anybody who loves and follows Jesus. So it's a key for a Christian in the last days to know that we and the Jewish people, every Christian and Israel, we are in this all together, whether we like it or not. And the same devil that hates them is the same devil that hates you. The same devil that's trying to still kill and destroy them is the same devil that's trying to still kill and destroy you. Number four, and we're done. Israel has a saving faith. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 says, I will pour out a spirit of grace upon Israel. That's Jesus. It says that they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. So part of the last day revival, the scripture is clear. Part of the end time revival, the end time pouring out of God's spirit, Israel will be included and God will pour out a spirit of grace upon them and they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. So they do not see Jesus as the Messiah now. But according to the prophet Zechariah, they will see Jesus, the one whom they have pierced. And God will pour out the spirit of grace on them. <laughs> Romans chapter 11, it gives us the bottom line of all that I'm saying. That God's not finished with Israel. God's not done with them. Let's look at verse 1. It says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel saying God had the 7,000 that were his remnant. Let's drop down to verse number 11. I say then, have they stumbled, speaking of Israel, that they should fall or that this would be final? That they would never make their way back? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. If you don't understand what that's saying, it's saying that because you and I have experienced the love of God. And as we show them the love of Jesus and they see our love for them and our love for, for God it will provoke them to jealousy. They will say, I want what they have. That's what I see in the Bible and I see it in them and it will provoke them to want what we have. We'll keep going here because you're not with me yet. Let's look at verse number 17. And if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Of course, the olive tree is speaking of Israel. The branch that's grafted in, that's you and I. Just read your Bible. Uh, John 15. Just keep think, think about it. That's, that's you and I. 
it says, do not boast against the branches. Watch this. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. They didn't believe. They were stubborn. They resisted. They didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. So they were broken off. And then you and I did believe we were grafted in. So it goes on to say, that's right. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And because you stood by faith, you were grafted in. Watch this though. But don't be haughty about that. Don't be arrogant about that. Don't be proud about that. Don't say, oh, they're just Old Testament because they're unbelief. God's done with them. No, 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 no. Don't do that. This is Paul rebuking that kind of an attitude. He's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Why? Watch it. He goes on to very clearly say, but, be, but have some respect, have some regard for the fact that they were cut off. Why? Because if God did not spare the natural branches or the natural Israel, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off, Of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and you are grafted in contrary to the nature into the cultivated olive tree. How much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? He's saying, I'm not done with Israel. That's what he's saying. For I do not desire brethren. Watch, this is the pastor, Apostle Paul, saying to the church of Rome, watch. I do not desire, brethren, that you will be ignorant of this mystery. Ignorant of what mystery? That God's not done with Israel. Don't be ignorant of it. It's a mystery. We don't fully understand it. The Bible goes on to say this chapter finishes with us, with God saying his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. But he continues on. Don't be wise in your own opinion. This mystery is not something in your own human wisdom you're going to be able to understand. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So there is still something for us to come into. There's still something God is pulling us into. There's still something God is raising us up for. But verse 26 bottom lines it. And so all of Israel will be saved as it is written. Do not throw away Israel is what Paul said. Do not dismiss them as Old Testament. They missed it. Of course they missed it. Their unbelief caused them to be cut off. But God is not done with them. And be reminded that God, because of his goodness, decided to graft you in. And don't become arrogant and think that you have a right to look down on them. Because in the same way they were arrogant and stubborn and they missed God in their that day, your arrogance and your stubbornness to dismiss them might cause you to miss out on the last day move of God. Even though you know the Lord, you know of the things of God, you can still miss it with the wrong mindset. And verse 25 says it is a mystery the connection that God has, the unique connection that God has with Israel. But this is what we do know about the mystery. This is what's clear all throughout your Bible. God wants to connect people that love Jesus. That's the church. He wants to give us a love for Israel. He desires in this last days to make that happen. He wants to give us a love for these people. And so anything you see on any platform, in any environment, in any way being distributed or spoken or said or implied, if you see something that is anti-Semitic, if you see something that is anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-church, it is anti-freedom. And when you see people stand up and threaten the church, if you talk from this book, we're going to come and do this to you. They're basically saying, make no mistake about it. We'll go to whatever extreme we have to because they're not being driven by a political agenda. It's a agenda from the pits of hell trying to deceive the world. And you have to protect your heart from that. 
Listen, I don't know everything, but I know what the Bible says. And that is you got to love God. You got to love his church and you got to love his word and you got to love what he loves. And I'm thankful that God gave us this book so we don't have to go at the world blind and just be pushed around by every wave of doctrine, every wind of of doctrine that gets thrown out because the Bible says that that's what happens in the last days, that seducing spirits and doctrines of demons will end up causing us to be seared in our conscience towards who? Towards God? No, we'll say we love God, but we don't like the church and we don't, we don't know about this thing and we don't know about that thing. And no, that's how the devil starts. He starts by picking on the church. He starts by picking on your freedoms. He starts by picking on Israel, but all that he's ultimately after your relationship with God and he's after destroying you and your family and you got to be wise he's very wise is what the scripture says be wise ask God for wisdom ask God to open your eyes don't listen to a preacher ask God to give you discernment concerning these things ask God to give you his heart concerning these things and it really does come back to Jesus what what does Jesus have to say in Luke chapter 7 there's this awesome story and it's a story about a centurion so this centurion, he's a, he's a Roman military leader, which means he's a Gentile. So Rome had invaded Israel. So the Jewish people in Jesus' time were living under the rule of the Romans. So this Roman leader, this Roman military leader that's enforcing the oppression on the Jewish people, he has a servant that's sick. And so the elders, the Bible says, comes to, they come to Jesus and they tell Jesus, this Gentile centurion, Roman soldier, has a servant that's sick. And the very first thing the elders tell Jesus is, we don't know why. He's not Jewish. He's not of our faith. He doesn't know our God. But the first thing they do is say, for some reason, he loves our nation. The elders start to tell Jesus, we don't know why, but even though he's here to oppress us, instead, he, he loves us. He sees the way we worship. He's outside the covenant. He sees the way that we have a heart for, for God and for his purposes. And it goes on to say, and he's also built us synagogues. He's built us places to worship and to honor God. And the Bible says immediately after Jesus heard that, he went to the centurion. Immediately after he heard what? This is a man that loves the nation of Israel and is doing anything he can to build places for them to experience the presence of God and the grace of God. In case you didn't catch it, you're that centurion. You're that Gentile. You're the one saying, we're going to build a place for those children to be under the protection. We're gonna build a place for them to experience that spirit of grace that was talked about. And the Bible goes on to say that Jesus goes to the centurion and the centurion says, I, I didn't think that I was worthy to come to you. I didn't think I was worthy because of who I am. And he says, I know that all you have to do is speak your word and my servant will be healed. And the Bible says Jesus looks at the Gentile who loves the nation of Israel, who's built her houses of worship, and who says to him, all you have to do is speak your word. And the Bible says Jesus marvels at his faith. There's only two times in your Bible that God marvels. And this is one of them. The other one is Matthew, Mark 6. He marveled at their unbelief. But here he marveled at a Gentile's love for God's nation, God's people, and his desire to build them a house. And Jesus is marveled by his faith. He marvels. The God that created the sun, the moon, and the stars, the God that created this planet, the universe, never does he marvel at those things. But he marveled at this man. And Jesus told him, Go, your servant has been healed. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, if we want 
the favor of God on our life. If we want to continue to see God's blessing and unprecedented. Listen to me, businessman. Listen to me, people that are looking for God to do incredible things. You want that on your, you want to see God prosper you? You want to see God's unique favor on your life? Again, the favor isn't because you're special, it's because he's special. It's not, at the end of the day, it's not for your glory, it's for his glory. But if you want that, you want to see that, then you favor what God favors. That's what Luke 7, that's what Jesus said. This is a man who's favored what I favor. And as a result, whatever he needs, I'm doing it for him. Thank you for watching Seven Hills Church's YouTube channel. I think there's a couple next steps for you as you're watching. First of all, I wanted to let you know you can join us live for our online experiences, totally interactive, live chat. We'd love to have you join us there. Also, don't forget if you don't want to miss out on all the new content that gets posted on our YouTube channel to subscribe. Thank you again for watching and we'll see you guys this weekend.